So we're very lucky to be meeting here this evening in the Ink Box in the Opera House, a special venue for a special occasion. My name is Sasha Morris and I am the Geo Educator for the Waitaki Whitestone Geo Park. Just want to start off quickly um, with a just quick health and safety briefing. Uh, should there be an emergency of any kind, um, you're just asked to go move to the exits. So there's an exit uh, here on my right and also through the door that you enter through and then we'll be directed by the Opera House staff. So the meeting uh, places out the front, uh, through the front doors, or alternatively you'll be directed around the back. Um, so this evening uh, we're very um, fortunate to have two guest speakers with us um, to give our talk as part of the Arts Festival here in the Waitaki. Um, so we've got Marcus and Manu. Um, and they're going to be um, talking uh, a marriage of science and art. And I'll be very fortunate to have a quick look at some of the um, some of the content. And we're all in for a big treat. We all know here in the Waitaki Whitestone Geo Park, uh, geological and paleontolo paleontological um, history is rich. And we're really fortunate that there's been so much study uh, done in this area. Um, through the university and individuals, and we're lucky to have um, some people here as guests this evening as well. Um, and so, so much is known. And this evening, we're going to be learning the science and also the artistic interpretation of that. So, looking forward to, I know that I'm going to be learning a lot this evening. Um, and just a word, some of these penguin um, things that we'll be looking at this evening. If you haven't seen, there is a wonderful um, remnant of a, a Penguin fossil up in Vanished World in Duntrim that you can see that was extracted from Parkside Quarry. So that's just something that you can actually go and have a look at yourself. So um, how we're going to run this evening is um, Marcus will speak first and then we'll hand over to Manu. Um, and I'll just ask you to hold your questions to the end. We will have a short time at the end for those. Um, and then we will wrap up the evening. So sit back and enjoy, and um, I'll just hand over to Marcus. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? All okay? Cool. Okay, right. So um, my name is Marcus, Marcus Richards, and I'm part of uh, the University of Otago. I've got some colleagues down the front here. I'm Ewan Fordyce. I'm Professor Ewan Fordyce, set up um, like I'm with the local community, um, the Vanished World Centre in Duntroon has been an active researcher in the Waitaki Valley looking at its ancient whales and penguins and dolphins for the last 40 um, years. Um, and, uh, and the other um, lab technician I work with, Sophie White's also at the front as well, and a good friend of mine, Henry Gard, who gave a, a, a geopark talk a few um, months ago here as well. So without any uh, further ado, I'm going to be talking about penguins in deep time. So in, in, the, in, the, in the long, long distant past, what role did penguins have in this part of the world? And I think they're very, very amazing animals and they're very inspirational for understanding um, sort of our place in the, in, in the world and, um, and also um, uh, nature's place in, in New Zealand. And so I'm just gonna take you through my journey a little bit first and then just get, get into the content and then we can start talking about um, the, the, the collaboration we, that we've, um, me and Manu and Barry have um, got into more recently. Okay, so my little pepeha, my little sort of background, um, I grew up um, partly in, in Tauranga in the North Island, Bay of Plenty, where there is a, a lot of uh, marine birds and I've always been interested in natural history. Um, so I started volunteering catching um, a North Island mutton bird, um, uh, monitoring their breeding um, populations with the local um, ornithological society um, up, on, up on the mount, Mount Monganui, um, at the beach in Tauranga. And uh, that, that eventually led on to the next um, phase of my involvement up there um, with that involved penguins because the arena, the arena um, hit Astrolabe Reef off Montiti Island just off the coast and a lot of horrible, um, very thick oil washed up on all the beaches and the penguins washed up covered in oil and if they didn't wash up, wash up covered in oil they walked through puddles of oil getting back to their nest on the rocks and 
a lot of them died from just preening themselves or losing their, their um, waterproofing and their feathers. So um, um, my father was um, was instrumental in setting up the night operations with penguins coming at night time. We'd go out and catch them and um, and send the world ones to um, the rehabilitation centre. So we'd, we'd catch them and, and, uh, and uh, we would band them and put microchips in them um, for a longitudinal study after after re-release. So I'll just, I'll just go through a bit more logically. So we'd hunt out on the, on the, on the beaches, at, um, on the rocky coast at dusk, and the penguins would come and hop up on the rocks and go into their little nests just above the high tide line. And we'd catch them if they were oiled. They went to a rehabilitation centre where they were cleaned and had nice little places to swim around. Oh, sorry. Um, and then we'd re-release them, but then we, for about three years afterwards, um, uh, recaptured individuals and just saw how their breeding were, was coming along, seeing how the animals were recovering, and they recovered quite nicely. Um, once they were released, they went back to being normal individuals and, and that sort of penguin society. So the rehabilitation hadn't affected them, and that was my first like intimate sort of close-up relationship with with penguins, and I really fell in love with them. They're very Funky, like a, a aggressive little little tights, really. But um, but they have a lot of spirit, and um, and they're very special. And you guys will know about them on the Kong as well. So, I then came to the University of Otago, and I got involved with the um with the geology department. I, I um, first came and studied zoology, um, study of um of wildlife, but I sort of fell into geology, understanding how landscapes have come to be and, and the changes in the earth through time and how animals play a part in that. So looking at fossils, ancient ancient life forms. So this is me putting together a part of a, um, a whale skull with a, with a uh, master's student at our, at our um, geology museum in the geology department. And we get involved in all these different sorts of things like uh, dissecting modern, modern whales and penguins and such to understand their anatomy and um, help us research ancient ones. Getting, I've gotten to be involved in all these different things, um, gone down to Southern Antarctic and looked at penguins there, and also um, dug up mowers. I've, I've had a lot of really rich, rich um, time there. But um, you only learn um, something like uh, uh, the deep time of, of organisms and uh, and build upon the knowledge that's there from the the, the legends who have, who have come before you. And um, Ewan, having spent 40 years working in the Waitaki, has amassed a huge range of interesting organisms and, and studied so much about them and learned so much about them, including this big Kairuku um, giant penguin, which um, would have stood about yay high, a very large individual. And so his work was instrumental for me to latch onto and learn from and build upon. And uh, before his time, um, in the sort of uh, 40s and 50s, um, Brian Marples was a professor of zoology at um, the University of Otago, and he came on field trips up to Duntroon to also collect um, whales and dolphins and learn about them. So Ewan was building upon what Marples had done. So there's when people give presentations saying, oh, I've done this and that, they're always building upon what other people have laid down before. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so that's where I've sort of um, gone through to be here today as a, as a lab technician working in the paleontology prep lab um, where we prepare up these amazing fossils and put them into our collections for researchers to use to study. But um, my focus is um, on what I did my masters on and what I'm really interested in is fossil penguins. So let's dive into that. So how did I get into fossil penguins? I already knew about modern penguins through the arena oil disaster, but I was doing my honours project mapping up in the Kyburn, which is part of Danzy's Pass, from the Manitoto over into the um, backs of um, the Marafinua River. And uh, in this beautiful landscape here, and walking in the river um, valley along the bank, I saw crumbling out of this face here, there were some bones sticking out. And I thought, oh, that must, that's very interesting, that's got to be very important. And they were just crumbling and falling into the river and the river was washing them away. So this was a um, about a 35 million year old piece of marine sediment that was there from when that whole part of uh, New Zealand used to be underwater. And I collected these bones and I did a masters on them and figured out all these different bones of different parts of this um, this large uh, penguin that lived about 35 million years ago and uh, and understood its relationships to other penguins that used to live in Antarctica at the time and such. And, uh, it really just opened my mind to, um, to um, penguins and their amazing deep history through time. And that's what's really inspired me to be here today talking to you about penguins. So I'll just dive into, into penguins. So first of all, birds themselves are, um, 
quite a bizarre group. The more you think about it, the weirder they are. They have, you know, scales on their feet. They have these weird things called feathers, and uh, and really they're just flying dinosaurs. They're just a, a, a member of the dinosaur lineage that managed to survive the um, KT boundary, the big asteroid impact 66 million years ago. And um, their main advantage is this amazing thing that they've developed for this, this, this type of flight with their forelimbs. That um, only a few lineages have ever really developed flight properly. Thinking of like insects and bats um, and uh, birds, there's very few groups you can, you can name. And having flight gives you a great advantage, but also you need to be very specialized in order to be able to fly. Very lightweight, very durable. Um, and. Uh, Penguins really don't seem to fit into birds when you think about it. They just they look they look very bizarre, and people often comment on how much they're like uh, like human beings. Really, um, you know, they sort of stand upright. They got these sort of chunky arms. They got this very personal beak. Very very amusing individuals. But you don't really think of birds when you see penguins. And it's because they've adapted to a very different lifestyle. So they actually fly through water. So most birds fly through air. Penguins have these very, very thick um, wings uh, that are, um, well, they're, 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 they're thick um, from front to back, but they're quite thin across, and they are, um, they're composed mostly of bone. There's not really any like um, uh, feathers hanging off the back, taking any of the drag or anything. It's just, just bones. So they're just slicing through water with these, these bony wings pushing themselves through the water that's over 700 times denser than air. But um, they've really carved out an, an amazing sort of part in the ecosystems and uh, they're very, very unique, very special. And they do, can do amazing things like hop, hop up multiple uh, flights of steps in a sense. Imagine if a human could hop higher than, than their height. Ewan took this photo at a zoo and that, that this photo is immediately preceding that one. <laughs> So um, yeah, they're, they're stunning animals. They, they, they constantly have bent legs. So they're pretty much walking around like this all the time, sort of waddling around. So they can always do this amazing spring with their legs when they need to. So amazing animal. But how do they get to be where they are today? How, how does an animal like that evolve? Or what sort of time frame does it evolve? But first of all, I just want to focus on New Zealand first, because New Zealand essentially has been the the, the lab, the experimental area where penguins have sort of found their feet and become what they are today. So just think about New Zealand first of all. So New Zealand is nowadays only about less than 10% of a greater landmass exposed above the sea. The rest of it has sunken beneath the waves and there's a lot of complicated tectonics. There's all these big fault lines cutting through that have pushed up the, the centre of this landmass to be exposed above above the waves today. And there's all these different chunks of different sorts of um, uh, basement rocks that make up uh, New Zealand. We have the, the schist in this part of the country, the schist and shales. And really it's through time on the side of Gondwana land, this is during the Jurassic long, long ago, during the dinosaur, um, reign of the dinosaurs, you have on the margin of this big continent that includes like Australia, Antarctica, India, Africa, South America, you just have all these different marine sediments slowly being squashed up on the side of New Zealand, um, on the side of the continent, and eventually makes makes this sliver called Zealandia. And then when it all breaks apart, um, New Zealandia is uh, sort of left up on its own. And so it's uh, this microcontinent sort of like drifting out to sea around the same time the dinosaurs go extinct. This this um, this raft has sort of drifted off, and uh, there's no mammals. Uh, there's there's a lot of birds. It's a very unique little ecosystem, which is uh, also um, uh, worth noting that through time, top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom. If you want to follow it <laughs> like that, so from the from the extinction of the dinosaurs, Zealandia slowly was sinking, slowly was sinking beneath the the, the waves, and then then you have the Alpine Fault start to activate, and you get all this uplift of mountains. And it starts to um, starts to push up again to be the, the shape that we, we know today. So we're in a very active landscape, but because there's been all this pushing up recently, everything's relatively young. The mountains in New Zealand are incredibly young, and we have all these ancient marine sediments that have been pushed up again. So we can we can see what was swimming around on the on the seabed back when New Zealand was mostly underwater. These very low lying islands, 
with all these shallow seas around them. So you can go somewhere like the Waitaki Valley today and see all this limestone exposed. So most New Zealand was underwater. There's not any longer the remnants of what was the seabeds back in the day is what we can find on land today. So the thing about penguins, penguins are one of the lineages of birds. We have um, all of these weird um, birds with, with teeth in their, in their beaks and, uh, and all these features that aren't really um, known in modern birds today, uh, surviving right up until the, um, the collision with, uh, with the asteroid 66 million years ago. And then we have um, all these, this radiation, all this expansion of all of these birds filling in all these um, gaps in the ecosystems that used to be filled in by other animals before the collision. And so we have this big radiation and one group that appears very early, only about, only about 4 million years, um, so about 62 million years ago, only about 4 million years after um, the dinosaurs go extinct, we have penguins. Penguins appearing in the fossil record. And it's one of the earliest lineages of birds that we actually have fossils of, that we have proof that there was part of that bird lineage is present that early straight after um, the, the impact. So it was, it was an early group of birds that filled in a new, new um, part of the ecosystem. Maybe that they, they, they were living as a seabird, um, not bef long before that, flying around, but eventually there was, a, there was an evolutionary trade-off. It was easier to be um, diving in the water, a bit more like a shag maybe, and eventually, um, eventually the loss of flight for, um, for the um, advancement of uh, underwater diving sort of took, took over. So you can think of them maybe as something like an orc or, or, or a shag. Um, so these earliest birds called Waimanu. So I'll just pick up a, uh, a life-size reconstruction that we have here at the, um, at the uh, geology department. So you can see there's a lot of features that sort of look like a, there's an image up there as well. There's a lot of features that look somewhat like a, um, a penguin, but there's a few features that look a bit more maybe like a shag or or, um, or a, or a um, crane or something, you have a very long, long bill, maybe for piercing fish. You have these foldable wings, that modern penguins can't fold their wings. Um, you have bigger feet, bigger webbed feet, so maybe they're using their feet a bit more for propulsion, maybe a bit more agile on land as well. And these are all things that have, that have been sort of traded off for more specialization and just swimming in more, in more recent times. But this thing is still definitely a penguin, though it still looks halfway sort of between a, a shag and a penguin, though it could not fly. So that is called Waimanu, and it is known from the um, Canterbury region, but also there are individuals known from this part of the country as well. And what age are we talking about? Beg your pardon? Age? Age, that's about 62 million years ago. Yeah, yeah, so not long, they're, they're the earliest penguins known in the world and that they are found in, in southern New Zealand, in Canterbury and, and also in Otago. So it seems like penguins, the earliest penguins are found here, they possibly evolved on this, you know, little continent that erupted off from the wild and no mammals, maybe less predators on land, a safer little place to become flightless, you know, but you still have to come on land to breed. Um, so then very quickly they got huge. So this is about 55 million years ago, this is um, Kumimanu, which is, um, was collected from Hampton Beach in a concretion, like Maraki Boulder, wow. and it was a very large penguin. So these are the largest penguins known in the world. And this is still before any ancestor of whales even thought of getting in the water. They're, they're close relatives of things like hippos. Um, these are from things that are 50 to, to um, 45 million years old. And these are these are the earliest um, whales that that are sort of called like sea wolves or, or like mammal crocodiles. They look very very fearsome. You wouldn't want to meet one um, if you if you're going to drink at the side of a of a of a of a, um, of a water body. Um, but these things still hadn't come around before penguins were already massive, swimming around the oceans, eating a lot of fish. That you know there were no mosasaurs. There were none of these big marine reptiles that had been top of the food chain. They'd all gone extinct at the and at the same time as the dinosaurs. Penguins got in there and got a lot of amazing food for whales to try and eat and catch up. And so through time, just, just quickly showing you sort of like through time from the KT boundary 66 million years ago through to today, zero million years ago, you just have these transitions from Waimanu through to all these 
interesting large giant penguins, and eventually to the penguins we know and love today. I'll just quickly go through that. Next big um, uh, group that we often talk about is Kairuku. So Kairuku is um, well known from rocks around here. And uh, Ewan collected a few, Marple's collected a few as well from the Waitaki region, places near Duntroon, um, and also in the Waihau. And uh, yeah, they were big birds. This bird isn't even, haven't even got its neck stretched out. This is a life-size reconstruction. So very long beak. It's got a very sturdy wing now. Can't bend it as much as the, as the, um, as the Waimanu. And, uh, and yeah, very, very large bird. You, sort of the size of a seal more than, a, than what we think of as a penguin around here today. Um, yellow lights are a lot, a lot, a lot shorter. This guy would have stood up to about here. So amazing, amazing animal. Quite, quite a large predator in the seeds. And so we have fairly complete specimens, so we can know actually quite a lot about these penguins. So they're quite large, they had these, they had these big long bills, and here's one of the specimens that you collected. And we can see some of the iconic bones like humerus and the femur and the tarsum and the tarsus, very diagnostic bones in penguins. But then we, um, the next phase really is, um, is what we sort of might regard as the modern group, the crown penguins. The um, penguins we still um, see around today, like the crested's and the, the, um, the emperor penguins and yellow eyes and uh, the, um, the, uh, um, the black footed penguins, the little blues. And New Zealand has one of the highest diversities of penguins um, uh, in terms of species in the world um, because we have all these different oceans mixing, all these different, um, we're bringing up welling, bringing all this food, all these different little islands for them to breed on. It's a very um, diverse um, um, spot and uh, bioproductivity um, seems to be one of the main drivers to, for where penguins are. They need places with a lot of, a lot of um, krill, a lot of fish. Um, and so you get them in places all the way from the Galapagos all the way down to New Zealand and a lot around Antarctica as well. So New Zealand is still very much a hot spot. And it's all about that relationship between um, the, the bioproductivity in the Southern Oceans. You have a lot of plankton, um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of algal blooms, you get a lot of, um, a lot of krill and plankton, and that's a huge food source for things such as small fish that penguins eat and for krill that um, whales eat. So um, one question that's often presented is why there are no longer giant penguins. Emperor penguin only comes up to about here, just under a metre tall, and we have penguins from, um, uh, from the Waitaki Valley and Hampton and such from um, deeper back in time that are this sort of size, so the size of things like, um, really like seals. So there's some thoughts that maybe um, but when dolphins actually started to come into their own and they developed eco-location and they um, sort of invaded these parts of the world about 30 million years ago, that's a, that seems to be about when giant penguins start to stop being found in rocks around here. And maybe they were being eaten like this illustration here. Or maybe other things like the dolphins and seals actually were eating the same food and so there was competition. So it's possible things like that were, um, were pushing out penguins, but the penguins have been there a lot longer. The penguins have been in these seas in New Zealand twice as long as, as, uh, as, as um, dolphins and, um, and, I mean, four times as long as, uh, as seals. And so um, now that we understand we have a, an amazing history of penguins in New Zealand, um, we should think a bit about modern penguins and, and their place in New Zealand. They, they, they have they have a lot of um, um, uh, they have a lot of significance um, for New Zealand's history. They've been here so much longer than us, so much longer than most other things here. And um, bar a few things like Tuatara, there are very few things that have been in New Zealand longer than penguins have. And things like yellow eyes are very are very much struggling at the moment. I was at the annual yellow eye penguin conference the other month, and it was very doom and gloom. Things like fishing, overfishing of that, that food sources and then caught nets and such is still a very big problem with yellow eye penguins. And it's important to remember there's so many other weird, funky, crazy things from sea bears to um, dermastilians, which were like a weird ocean hippo, to killer, killer sperm whales with giant teeth and weird, weird reptiles that swim in rivers called tristodeers and, and um, aquatic sloths. So all these amazing things that used to be in the oceans that are no longer just because they've gone extinct through time. And yet penguins have 
carried on the whole, whole way through and managed to survive everything nature's thrown at them, except possibly us. So we just need to be aware of that and, and, uh, and keep rooting for, the, for them and, uh, and support them in any way we can. And uh, yeah, like Penguins did win Bird of the Year two years ago, which is great. But there's, there's more we still need to do, but we should understand that ocean sentinels, if they're having trouble in the oceans, other things will obviously do as well. And that's something very special to New Zealand, you know? You can find a penguin, you can find um, uh, a penguin in a rock on the beach that's 60 million years old, and there'll be a penguin walking beside you that's, you know, still living and breathing today. It's amazing, the amount of stretch of time there. So that's, that's me, and I'll be helping Manu with his section, but um, now I, I leave the floor to Manu and, uh, and his talk about our collaboration we've done together. Well, oddly enough, my sort of start into this started with the Dancy's Pass as well. I was a child over in St. Bathans and my mother started courting a man who was living in Toparati. So I spent a lot of hours going over the Dancy's Pass in the back of a Morris van <laughs> and um, <laughs> then spending a bit of time up in North Otago here and being kind of in awe of the elephant rocks, you know, as a playground as a child. They've got something quite kind of magical about them. And, you know, I just put that down to a childhood fancy. And then in 2010, I did an exhibition at the Forester Gallery where I looked into limestone a little bit more and realized that they do actually have this magical thing about them, that they've got all these stories hidden inside. And I'd never sort of considered that life could make up the earth before. And that was a really sort of big thing to get my head around, having never really done the sciences myself. It's been a wonderful thing to be contemplating. So at that time, I did these three pictures sort of based on forms of the elephant rocks, but you probably can't see from where you are, but there's little cutouts in there of some of the things that make up make up the body of the rock there. We've got um in fact Marcus can probably tell better the detail there. Well, we got a we got a dolphin cut out at the bottom of the sharp toothed dolphins, the ones that were eating the penguins in the drawing earlier. We got cutouts of uh, bits of bryozoans, they still make reefs off the coast today. Um, and reefs on places like Fogo Strait, and just all of these other little critters that were living on the seabed or in the water column, and they will die and just make up this this graveyard of debris on the on the ocean bed, and that's how the ocean bed builds up through time. And so, at that time, I tried to get my head a little bit around this idea of deep time as well. How could things build up? to such a degree that you can go down to Western and see this huge quarry. And then I thought about snow, and I thought, well, maybe it's just like snow that doesn't melt, that just gently settles and accumulates. And it was a really sort of marvelous thing to think about and investigate a little bit. And then sort of time passed and went off in different directions. And then a couple of years back, this art and science collaboration came about. And I went along to the, what was it, like a speed dating <laughs> afternoon where there were maybe 60 people giving four minute presentations each. But I kind of noticed that all the geology presentations were quite funny. You know, that seemed to me like a subject that was very static and might be quite dry, yet everybody was talking with such vigor about it. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's something in there. And so I approached Marcus and we had a sort of great time. It's been a great time for me, really learning a lot more about all this 
all those topics. Uh, so you can see one of the images that I've made as an outcome from this out there, the maze, which is a little bit like what Marcus was talking about before, the sort of parallel timeline of Zealandia coming to be where we are now from the Nguana land and the evolution of penguins. So this is the uh, sort of colors of that geological time scale going from Zealandia in the middle and a sort of maze through various penguins to the sort of contemporary penguins on the outside. And one of the kind of great, <laughs> one of the great things for me has been unlearning some of my just popular science ideas of evolution. I really sort of just considered that it was like a ladder that things got better and better and better and better, superseding the last. And so to kind of break that a little bit has made life and this long time a lot more interesting, you know, that it's much more of an interplay with the environment and everything else that's happening at the time. And so on, on that note, I thought, okay, so maybe it's more like a maze. It's not just one direction. It's going off everywhere all the time. And then I went into the lab and did a little bit of drawing of Marcus one day when he was putting together the air bone of a whale that was, how old did you say? About 20 million years old. And the sort of spark of joy that you could see over his face when he got that last piece of that air bone put together just seemed like such a sort of poignant moment that there might even be like these reverberations through time of something all of a sudden being able to hear again back into this like lovely deep deep past so i've done a similar technique of cutting out just some sound waves in there just that's right i'm, I'm just going to leave these out afterwards if you want to um cycle through and get a closer look at the cut out pieces but then i also asked marcus if there was sort of any reading that i could do to enlighten myself a little bit and he lent me this fabulous book that's full of um, short essays sort of three or four page essays on various aspects of evolution but with these marvelous illustrations just black and white photographs of skeletons from the mostly Paris Natural History Museum and really gave me this idea that bones could be this marvelous story you know they they weren't just a halloween skeleton they held all this other information in there Could I give a chat about absolutely <laughs> so the cool thing about bones is that we all have them and we all have them for a reason as well they're they're the they're our, our structural structural center there they're what everything else builds onto so you look at a bone and you can tell what the organism was what the organism was trying to use um, its body for because there's all of these attachment sites for muscles and, um, and other organs to inter interrelate and uh, and allow the animal to function in its environment in a certain way and that's how we can learn so much about the ancient bones we find in the ancient seabed um, that is exposed all around the Waitaki Valley, for example. So bones, once you start learning all the little tricks of what what bones can tell you, you can learn so much about animals. And, and it's, it's a real amazing thing to unlock and to learn. And so seeing Marcus putting these bones together in the lab made me think of a very, very sort of simple connection I've got a nine-year-old at home, and so we've been doing lots of jigsaws. And I thought, he's just like he's doing this amazingly complicated jigsaw. And um, 
And so I thought, okay, so it's kind of got to be big thing because we're talking about these like lovely long times. And so here's, here's a board that I've cut out and here's some of the jigsaw pieces. I did end up making some large scale jigsaws. Well, that's right. Thinking, thinking about it being a very interactive thing, I'd, I'd put sort of evolution into very little pockets and not really thought so much about the interactive nature of it. So I've tried to um, tried to go on that theme with some of these large woodcuts. Here, the white miner is kind of juggling the nautilus shells, thinking about something that might have been in the ocean for a long time and also something that's quite kind of playful. There seems to be something quite fun about the pattern and it's something that really has struck me all the way through that Marcus has got this great enthusiasm for this subject that I'd kind of imagined to be very static. <laughs> Pop quiz, you can probably ID the penguin species on here if, you, if you've been listening. <laughs> Prize afterwards. <laughs> That's right, so this there's my Waimaru juggling juggling the Nautilus. And then I uh, went fast forwarded through a few million years to the Kairuku. And so this time I was really thinking about this. Uh, journey of, Z of Zealandia coming from Gondwana land. Uh, this actually came as just a little spontaneous moment when I was talking with somebody else about parenthood and they were saying it's like spinning plates. And I thought, ah, tectonic plates. And, and this, this idea that, you know, ev evolution's driven by this, you know, constant movement of everything all the time. Including the land itself. Including the land itself. Yeah, yeah. And, and so the poles that are holding up the plates have got these changes in the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, and so that, that was another thing that Marcus was talking about, uh, how it's a helpful tool in dating where your layers of rocks can be, if you can find something that's got the magnetic. Yeah, and, and also just, just how much the world can change, too, like the, the continents themselves move, but even the, the poles of the earth can switch, and there's so much time elapsing, and yet we still have these penguins still living in the ocean, still doing that thing, still surviving, it's, they've managed to survive through so, so much. Yeah, very special. And that's right, then, then I sort of, on that note, moved on to the sort of modern penguin, and this time, swimming through a circle of octopus, I um, taken several tangents on this evolution of breeding and had just finished a book about octopuses and and that sort of amazing long evolution that they've had in sort of in in tell how intelligent they are but how how separate the pathway to their intelligence was our most common ancestor doing something like 600 million years ago, is that right? Really, like, really amazing long time back. Yeah, and, and so I've really kind of enjoyed this idea that a bit of playfulness can be inserted into this learning yeah. about. And also, if I can say mm -hmm. so, the, um, the Puzzles were an absolute treat at the at the exhibit that this was first given at um, a, what, a few months ago. Um, yeah, the, the, the kids absolutely loved it, and it all will be coming up next year, won't it, Manu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. The whole um, the whole of the art and science collaboration from this round 
caught in stone will be uh, at the Forrester Gallery um, sometime in early 2022. And I'm hoping, I'm not sure if it will, will be part of that exhibition, but between now and then I'm hoping to do another sort of playful take on it where I'm going to try and make a phylogenic tree of the penguins, but make it as a mobile, so have it hanging from that sort of top point where the dinosaurs mostly disappeared, and then have it sort of cascading upwards in a more of a sort of motion based work. say um, I've just been very inspired on how inspired Manu's gotten by this this collaboration we've had a lot of fun and we could both talk for hours about all of the stuff here even though it might only just look like a few a few outputs there's so much work like um, discussed about it and there's a lot of deeper meaning in it as well we, we, we see and we've both really enjoyed this collaboration well, one, one of the deeper meanings that I've found in it has been um, a real sense of connection to life on the planet through learning about evolution. I've, I've previously done a reasonably big projects working with somebody who had been collecting stories from the Pacific about birds and their, their sort of place and so I've been thinking in these kind of really narrative ways about this connection to this sort of origin story and then part way through reading about evolution I realised this is just what I'm reading again it's a real sense of connection to our origin and it's exciting thanks I suppose um, we should open up to, to questions. We're, we'd be quite happy to chat with anyone, and then I guess once questions end, if you want to, you can all come down and look at look at things as well and talk to us. We'll have a face mask on an invite. But um, yeah, we've got two microphones, so should we do some questions? Yeah, just before um, before we start the questions, I'd just like to uh, say a huge thank you for your talk. Um, Especially, Manu, I like your line that you became aware that life could make the earth. And uh, at the Geopark, we tell the story of Zelandia, and you've both done it so beautifully this evening, that it's the, the rocks tell the story of the formation, and the life gone before us tells the story as well. So when we look at these objects, they're just not objects that we can learn about just then, but they, they reflect so much of the past, of the environment, where they've been, where they're going, and uh, and just how special our modern day penguins that we have here. So of course we've got the beautiful little blue penguin and the yellow eyed penguin here in Omaru, and how fortunate are we? And to, you know, I didn't realise that penguins have been around that long. This incredible. Way longer than whales. Yeah. yeah. So I celebrate the penguin, hey? It's awesome. Um, so thank you. And uh, we do look forward to seeing your um, the event and it's called in stone as well towards the middle of next year. Um, people are interested in that, jump on our Facebook and our web page because we will be involved in promoting that as well. So we'll look forward to engaging with you guys again. Um, but for now just to open up for questions. Um, and just, we'll probably just yell them out if that's okay, and then I can listen and just repeat it um, so everyone can hear. Yes? Have you fleshed out a, a lot of the bones? I mean, can you can you reconstruct it in a, you know, like, um, um, like if you have all the musculature on it? Yeah. You know? So from yeah, the yeah, early so ones all the way, I mean, you, you yeah, saw yeah. that. So, so to sort of um, uh, rephrase the question, how do you sort of reconstruct the, the animals from, mm -hmm. from the bones? So we do have, we do have um, uh, collections of bones. I, I won't, won't go back to the slides. In fact, Manu's um, drawing off why Manu is, uh, is, is quite good there because he's, he's shown the bones that we actually know of, of the Waimanu bird. Um, and uh, 
we, we don't ever get complete skeletons. Kairuku, um, the big the big um, penguin, we do actually have most of the skeletons. So you're always lacking some material, but you can sort of infer from, from there. But we still do have quite a lot of, of this animal. We have its foot, we have one of its wings, we have a lot of the midsection, the pelvis, and the, the shoulder area, and we have some of its very long bill and some of the neck. And, and yes, you can build based on like the size of, of, of of the bone, of the muscle scars and such on bones, you can sort of infer the size of the muscles and things you can build on top of that. And that's in fact how we get these amazing um, life constructions that we use for our outreach at the Geology um, that were done by Chris Gaskin. So he, he, you can actually see on the Waimanu um, drawing, he sketched the bones and then he built everything else on top basically knew about modern penguins and, and, uh, and that's how we get reconstruction so you can go about it in a sort of quasi-scientific way but you, you there is a modeling nowadays where people actually in, in computer programming they actually build build muscular systems on bones and see how they would move and such and that's how for example last week people um, have come some scientists have come up with a paper saying they think dinosaurs wave their tails when they walked mm -hmm. you know, because they're, they're putting all the information about the bones to a computer model and building muscles on them and seeing how they react against them um, some uh, natural forces, so th there is all these Good. potentials. Have, have to you look done into. some of that? No, no, um, that, that's the, I'm more on the, the taxonomy side, just trying to describe. But we've got so many more penguins, we still only have a few bones that we don't know exactly what they are. So I'm, look, I'm more on that side, but that's always a possibility. The, the materials here for some to do it at some point, yeah, if they wanted to. Yeah, how do you, how do you tell well, which bone is which when you're um, uh, when you've only got part of a bone? Yeah, well, I mean, um, the amazing thing about um, penguins is they got and an birds as well that they got they've got very distinct bones. Um, most birds have very similar bones, except for maybe the the, the, the size and how um, how gracile or robust they are. Um, just because birds have a very strict body plan to be able to fly, so most birds they look all quite similar when you get down to the bones. There's just a few subtle differences. They're all longer and bigger and smaller and whatnot, and the, the skulls are usually quite different because the, your your beak determines how you feed, um, uh, and so bird bones they're quite there's quite a regular pattern to, that you can read into. Um, penguin bones are very diagnostic because they're very dense, they have to be very 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 solid, so to enable them to help them sink when they swim and just bob into the surface. So they've got very unique bones, so you can tell. Oh, this is obviously a bird bone, but it's really dense. And it's got a few big muscles that other birds don't have, as you can tell by certain like um, fossae, certain depressions on the bones where the muscles would attach. And you say, ah, oh, that's definitely a penguin. Um, and then we actually have a few specimens where we've pretty much found the whole penguin um, in one go. So they use that as your and a fossil penguin. So you use that as your baseline, but also modern material dissected modern penguins, looking at all the muscles and how they go together, um, and also. Um, skeletons of modern penguins helped a lot as well. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's sort of a knack. It's like getting used to sort of any, anything really, ultimately. If you start off not, I started off not knowing anything about, about um, bird bones. I found some old bones on a farm once and threw them away thinking they were cow bones. And then, <laughs> then looked at my photos a year later and was like, oh. <laughs> so, it, you know, everyone starts off not knowing much, you know, and it just, you sort of start from that and then you eventually just learn more and more and they become very familiar to you. And, it's just a skill like anything else, yeah, yeah. Um, most of your early penguins tend to be reasonably sizable. Do you have yeah. any examples of little ones or not? Not many. There aren't many examples of little penguins early on, but that's possibly in part because they're harder to spot in the rocks. They just want a big bone sticking out of a, a cliff face or something and collecting that. There are a few examples of little penguins, um, but whether it's a preservational bias, like little bones more likely to get scavenged or scattered on the seabed or chomped by something, um, like a shark, um, might yeah might be less likely to preserve them, but also um, maybe maybe there were just um, a lot more large ones. But to be honest, I think there would have been the whole spectrum. To be to be honest, but the bigger ones are easier to spot. But it's it's the change nowadays is that we've lost the larger size. Sort of a downwards pressure of some sort, it seems. But yeah, it's interesting. Was that ecological? I mean, it, did it, the environment change in some um, way? The environment has changed. Um, uh, we've gone from uh, a warmer ocean, it was a lot warmer back then, it's gotten a lot colder more recently, but 
I think the biggest change probably is what you get with things like seals and dolphins turning up. There's these competitors or predators or both that have possibly sort of taken away that space in the ecosystem for a larger penguin to make its living. Um, so it, 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 it is hard to say, but um, it, the more, more penguins we find in the fossil record and we describe, the more sort of gaps we fill in in the record. There's so much more to learn still about fossil penguins. There's so many more around this part of New Zealand to, to find and learn about. The yeah, more we fill in the gap and get larger snapshots of like that family tree, the more we'll determine when penguins have gotten, have, have um, been larger or smaller and such, and we'll sort of figure it out. But there's still a lot of our unknowns, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when you're finding parts of a skeleton, because obviously that's all you do find is parts, is there a sort of standard ratio you have? Like if you find a foot bone, can you deduce that it's a creature that's at least a metre tall, but won't be more than two metres tall? Um, yeah, there, there's a bit of a range in, in that, because some the, the earliest penguins um, had different proportions, um, but uh, yeah, usually you can for certain time intervals. You know that there's a general body plan around at that time, and you can sort of infer. But it's it, it depends. There's some penguins that were very stocky and very very stout, but were the same size as a penguin that was a lot more grey style, a lot more fit, slender, but, and and some of their bones were just shorter and longer at certain parts of the body, but ultimately they were the same height. So I mean, it's it's. It, you should always be wary of inferring from a few bones, but something like mm -hmm. Kairuku. Kairuku is probably the, the best determined height for, for a large fossil penguin because most of the skeleton has been found. And so we, we know its body proportions a lot better than most. Um, uh, yes? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Hello. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Love both of your work. And the exhibition coming here uh, next year as, as a plan for its tour of uh, New Zealand and um, are there long term plans to house all your beautiful materials in one place? Um, I'm not sure if there's plans for it to travel further. It, um, it comes from an initiative that's with the um, Tago University and the Polytech down there and it's an art and science collaboration that they usually, or have done for a while, do every year. And they have a different theme every year. A couple of years back they had art and ocean. And I think that that may have also come to the Forester. Next year's going to be air as the theme. So who knows where that goes. Um, my personal work, I'm also going to have an exhibition of it at my family's gallery, which is out on the peninsula at McAndrew Bay in Dunedin. Um, I was supposed to have that during last lockdown, but I haven't rescheduled yet, just so I might as well wait. It's a, it's a subject that's not very time sensitive, you know? <laughs> Charter show at the start, or sorry, halfway through your lecture, there was one group of birds, I think they were identified as near rings, uh, uh, who survived the asteroid. So are all modern birds essentially evolved from that one small fortunate group, maybe geographically lucky group of feathered dinosaurs? Yeah, yeah, it, it seems um, we have maybe about three parts of the modern bird group. Um, that we know were probably around just at just at the um, uh, impact. Mm -hmm. So you have the the um, the ratites, which are um, things mm -hmm. like moa and kiwi and such, the paleonates. Um, they they were a group that was they're the most basal group of birds. So they they were probably around because we already also have um, uh, water water and land fowl, very early relatives of the fowl early ancestors of the fowl, they were around just at Cape E3, some that got found in Denmark um, in, in um, Belgium uh, two, two years ago, and it's a sort of an, it looks half like a chicken, half like a duck, mm -hmm. and it was just right at the bottom of the fowl group, which is the next group after the paleonates, the ratites, and then um, uh, there's a few things like penguins found pretty quickly after, after that as well, so there was just, um, 
maybe there wasn't just one bird, mm. but there might have just been yeah, maybe right. just a few species mm. with a few little differences, um, uh, and uh, and then from there just exploded. There was just so much opportunity for this this um, odd group that could fly and do all these other things, and there weren't any big um, big dinosaurs lumbering around. So some got pretty big pretty quick and became herbivores and became the big rat heights we know today, ostriches, nylor, etc. Others took the skies and became big predators like hawks and whatnot, and others became big predators in the oceans like like penguins. The other group, you've seen the last slide, said that we were penguin central. We are. I'm not saying we yeah. shouldn't be, but I would have thought it would have been the southern islands. So, but, so, so there is there. So um, Otago itself isn't isn't uh, a centre of modern penguins necessarily, but it's. I think the most interesting place in the world in terms of penguins as a whole story because we have quite a few species of modern penguins that come as vagrants to our coasts or as um, or do live here and also we have the biggest amount of history for any part of the world in one little place. So New Zealand has the best record of fossil penguins. You can find fossil penguins from 60 million years ago through to today pretty much in succession through different ancient marine rocks all through this part of New Zealand and you can just read the rocks and read find all the different parts of the penguin lineage just scattered through those rocks and then there's penguins just on the coast and yeah there are parts in you know Falkland Islands and such south and south southern South America where there's a lot of penguin species all in one place and there's mm -hmm. millions and millions of them we do have a lot in our southern Antarctic Islands here as well but um yeah New, New Zealand as a country has some of the highest diversity of penguins though there's more numbers over in um over in you know southern South America and such, but um, New Zealand still is a very, very special place. Um, Thank you. It's a very hot spot. Why, why, do you, why do you think that they haven't spilled over into the northern hemisphere so much? That's a good question about the northern hemisphere. Possibly there's just there's just other groups already in, in, in charge, essentially, up there already taking up those niches. There's groups like the orcs, uh, other seabirds that are quite, that can fly, except for the flight of this great orc, which is now extinct, which is kind of like a penguin. But there, there are these birds up there that can fly like hawks that are very good underwater and also in the air, sort of like our petrels down here. Um, that's a good question. I mean, for example, albatrosses are in the northern Pacific, but they're not in the North Atlantic, for example. So there, there's there's sometimes reasons like the, the tropics act as a as a boundary usually that sort of like these deserts in the ocean often that different sorts of productivity and, and animals often can't get between the two poles where the biggest productivity is and there just seems to have been other things. In fact, in one of my slides, I showed a, a diving bird that um, essentially was the penguin of the Northern Hemisphere, but it, it went extinct. So it's this bird here, it's called a Platopterid, and it was closely related to things like gannets and boobies. And it actually became something quite like a penguin, but not, not as well adapted for swimming as modern penguins, but it was sort of similar to a Waimanu, so bendable wings, but they got quite big. They got about this large as well. Um, but they were only around for about 20 million years, from about 40 to about 20 million years ago, then they vanished, and they were only in the North Pacific. So there might have been other things at times that were competitively excluding invasion via penguins. Yeah, and there were a lot of big mammals like um, oyster bears roaming the coasts of North America and stuff that probably would have munched a penguin if it landed, whereas New Zealand's <laughs> always been a Relatively nice safe place to be a bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty fascinating. I mean, one of the coolest animals ever, I think, is these um, these marine sloths that lived off on the side of South America that would swim in the oceans and eat eat seagrass. And and, uh, and this is a bit of a fanciful drawing, but you have a, a, a smaller type of uh, killer sperm whale feasting on one. But they're found in the same rocks, so it's definitely possible. It's fascinating stuff, though. There's so many weird things in the oceans, and all these are very weird, but. When you think about penguins as well, penguins are incredibly weird and unique and odd too, so they're very special. There's a lot of things that we sort of take for granted in this world that are very bizarre, including us, of course. But, but yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all very inspirational, I think, and when you think about why should I care about things, well, penguins are part of this odd group, and we should care about them. Thank you very much. I'd just like to um, extend a thank you to Marcus and Manu. I'd just like to join me with a... So I think that the penguins obviously have a very special place here in the Waitaki White Stone Geopark. 
of the story that they tell. And I know, you know, when I'm talking to school, school children, when I explain about the size of some of these ancient penguins, they're immediately thinking, far out. I don't think I'd like to swim with one of those at the beach. You know, that's as tall as my teacher. So um, wonderful, um, wonderful talk that you've both brought to us this evening. And we do have some goodie bags filled with some local treats. I'm not going to bring them out because they'll go clean, clean against the microphone. So we'll give them to you afterwards. So thank you.